We are recording now. All right, here we go. <clears throat> and welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. We've got a pretty special show today. Joining me to discuss a pretty important topic um, in the world of photography are Ms. Renee Robin, Mr. Shiv Verma, and Aberinex Perillo down in Los Angeles. Hey guys, how you doing? Good. Good. All right, you guys are hanging in there. Um, you know, I just want to do a quick roundtable. We got a lot to discuss. So I want to do a quick roundtable. I don't think we've ever had this particular quorum together on the show. And in fact, just a few minutes ago, you guys just met each other. So this is going to be this is going to be an interesting show. So Barry, next, why don't, you, why don't you start off? Tell us who you are, where you're from, and all that good stuff. Um, I'm Barry Nex. I'm down here in the Los Angeles area. And I'm the host and producer of uh, The Candid Frame, which is a podcast in which I've been interviewing photographers for the last nine years. I have over 260 plus uh, episodes on my channel at thecandidframe.com. And I'm also a photographer, and a writer, and an educator. And, uh, yeah, published, published author, right? Published author. That's what I told my wife. She's got to respect me. I'm a published author. <laughs> <laughs> whenever you're too well. whenever you're having an argument you're like wait wait i'm a published author okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me know how that works out for you <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> awesome all right next on the list is miss renee robin coming to us from the uh the balmy warm canadian <laughs> area we're in alberta up there somewhere right What's yeah i i'm a canadian photographer digital artist and uh loud mouth on the internet um it's uh it's it's cold up here <laughs> I just got look, from, <laughs> all we can see is your eyes it's, it's <laughs> i just got back from california i did like three weeks there so it is really cold right now <laughs> yeah yeah hey yeah, but no, I'm, I'm a photographer and i i'm a speaker and an educator and so on and so forth so yeah and you're very rarely home you were always traveling and teaching right last year i was home seven weeks the entire year wow Gee. <laughs> okay somebody's got to do it i gotta tell you <laughs> all right well welcome also on the show is mr shiv verma coming to us from the east coast who's uh you're you're in an igloo over there right shiv oh yes <laughs> buried in snow <laughs> i mean it's, this is unbelievable i mean i can just well imagine what uh the poor chaps in buffalo did a few months ago yeah 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 snowmageddon so tell yeah. us about tell us about you shiv what are you up to um, the usual, uh, lots of workshops, um, one day workshops. Um, I'm in the throes of, uh, doing some more analysis on these mirrorless cameras and their capabilities. And we'll talk some more later on in the show, but, uh, really it's, uh, it's been fascinating as to what's going on and, uh, you know, how technology is making my life so much easier. Love it. Um, so yeah. And, uh, and I also want to add that, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, with TWIP and uh, some of the TWIP programs, we can, you know, get another trip going to Iceland for, uh, you know, maybe it's time to talk about it. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's yeah. that's definitely going to happen. So, yeah, yeah we, we definitely need to talk about that. Oh, yes. All right, guys, let's uh, let's dive into this stuff here. So, um, you know, the, the first topic that I want to talk about is the, let me give you, let me, for the audience, let me set the groundwork for this. So, a good friend of mine, Renee Robin, and I <laughs> were, just were having, throw me under the bus, right? You know, now. Yeah, the, you should have saw the bus park there before you come <laughs> came on the show. <laughs> so, Renee, so basically, the impetus of all this was the the Peter Lick print that sold for six plus million dollars, uh, what last late last year, and sort of the turmoil that came up around that. We even talked about it on this week in photo briefly, but Renee basically, and I think I mentioned it in that episode, made the comment that photographers are not artists. She said photographers are not artists, but then she went on to qualify it by saying that photographers are not artists because many photographers are not artists because they can, the cameras are doing much of the work and it makes it too easy, whereas real artists are out there sort of figuring out the dynamics of light and shadow and and you know, diving deep into it. In other words, it's too easy for us. So Renee, you obviously have to go first since this whole show is because of <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. why don't you set the record straight, qualify it. Are right, photographers so, artists? 
So, so just I'm going to preface this with if you're going to send me hate mail, my email address is Frederick Van Johnson at twip.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that will bounce. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, actually, I didn't sleep last night because I, I have never stated this opinion publicly. <laughs> uh oh. Good. Because I know it's a sensitive topic, right? Because everybody, everybody's creators, and and we all feel that we're artists and so on and so forth. But uh, I find that photography is creative, but I find an, a lot of cases it's a cheap form of art. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest reason behind this is that there literally is a make it awesome button for a lot of photographers, you know, it's, um, I mean, we've seen this huge boom in the industry, which is great in so many ways. I mean, that we're going from an industry where people were, you know, back when we were doing film, right? We were, you, you had to study, you spent years and years and years and years trying to get these images with great composition, beautiful lighting and getting it as close to accurate as you can in camera, which is a funny thing to say because I'm a digital artist and I don't get anything in camera. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, at the same time, you know, literally there is a multi-million dollar industry in making shitty photos, not shitty, from hitting an action of going like, oh, here's your photo. I mean, like you see this on Facebook on like your ads all the time. It's all over Google ads. It's all over everything where it's taking people who are um, really not good and making them average very easily, right? With, with no effort at all, with very little effort. Yeah. I find that is uh, a little disheartening in an artistic sense. Because when you, when you look at art, uh, you know, and the same thing can be said for, for, I mean, the same thing is said for DJs in the music industry, right? Where people are saying, you know, oh, well, these people who've never played an instrument in their entire life are suddenly making music. And it's like the, the beauty of the remix. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair though, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I see nothing wrong with saying that a photographer isn't necessarily an artist. I think for the first five or 10 years of a photographer's life, that it would be, it would be hard for them to say that they're an artist. Mm -hmm. I mean, like <clears throat> photography is an art when you boil it down because you're being creative, you are expressing the way that you see the world, so on and so forth, right? Like it's so, it's so complicated and it's never, nobody's ever going to agree on it. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of email in my inbox telling me that I'm wrong and a bad person because of my opinion. But Renee, Renee, what about what about the idea of and this is devil's advocate and you guys, Shiv and Baronax, feel free to jump in if you want. And, you know, what about the idea of, uh, you know, this is technology advancing. Right. So, you know, back in the in the early days of cave drawings, they didn't have digital cameras with program mode on it, so they couldn't use it. If they had them, they would have used them, you know. If, yeah. uh, you know, Da Vinci had had a DSLR, maybe he would have done something different, but he didn't. So he used the tools at hand. Artists today or photographers or not photographers are using the tools at hand today to create their visions with what they have available. Why should they have to, why should it have to be hard in order for it to be art? I think because the difference is, is that I'll pay $700 a ticket to watch Vanessa May, who's an incredible violinist, play live. And mm -hmm. you can't pay me to go to a, like an elementary school play. Yeah. Right. That's where the biggest difference comes in. Right. Vanessa May, even though she's, she's a, a, a musician, Vanessa May is, is extremely talented and has spent years and years and years and years of her life getting exceptional at what she's doing. She's an artist. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas somebody who's just picking up the violin, right. They're just learning, right. They're, they're growing and evolving. When you, when you look at musicians or painters, there's no easy button. There's no like make it more awesome button like there is in the digital art field. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, as much as I love digital art and I think it's freaking awesome, like I'm not knocking our industry saying like, oh, this is bad. I think it's great. I think it's awesome that there are so many people now who are being extremely creative in the best way that they can be. But I think that it doesn't necessarily make them a, a true quote unquote artist when you're using an action that you bought online that somebody else made that yeah. somebody else has designed and just applying it to what you're using, right? Yeah. It, um, I think it just, it just cheapens it a little bit. So yes, it's creative, but is it necessarily an art piece that is going to have a lot of value in the future? I think it's unlikely. We don't have photographs behind bulletproof glass. That doesn't exist, right? It's easily replicated. We can just hit print, right? We're selling it for cheap. Um, as much as I think it's incredible that, uh, our industry has gotten so prolific and because it's become so popular with everybody, the technology has just exploded and what we can do is amazing. 
but it's also cheapened the work. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. Hey, Barry, next, what do you, what do you think? Should well, I think yeah, go for it. I think photography is probably one of the only art forms where people can get into this argument largely by focusing on the on the process rather than the end result. Um, you know, when you talk to a writer or a painter, you, there's not an argument of whether you use a typewriter or a word processor or, you know, what kind of brush that you're using. I think that because photography is so accessible that the argument uh, as to whether or not it's art becomes more pronounced than it is with any other art form. Mm -hmm. uh, just the fact that you can press a button and make an image. Uh, people assume that's, uh, that's all it takes to make an exceptional body of work. But, you know, you look at... Flickr and you go to a museum or you look at a, at a monograph, you see a huge difference in the quality of the work that's out there. And I think that people who want to make this debate of whether or not, you know, photography is art are more fixated on the process than they are looking at the end result. Because I think if you look at exceptional work, all the things that go into painting in terms of an awareness of lighting, in terms of composition, tonality, all of those things come into play. And just because someone can make a nice picture of their cat that gets them a lot of likes on Facebook uh, doesn't necessarily qualify them as an artist. Uh, yeah. There are people who photograph cats and dogs uh, who do amazing work. And whether it's captured largely in camera or whether it's uh, facilitated by, by Photoshop, you see a consistency in their work. Yeah. Everybody can make a, a, a pretty decent picture that might or might not qualify as art. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that person is an artist because an artist, I think, uh, for the most part, has um, uh, concepts, ideas that they're pursuing in their work um, that goes beyond just making a good singular singular image. You look, you know, you give somebody, you get a portfolio for someone who's been shooting for a while. You go through that book and you, you're just amazed because they're able to say something with those photographs and the issue doesn't become you know, what kind of camera you use for most of the people who are experiencing the photograph. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that, that uh, you know, once you take that whole argument about how easy it is to make a well-exposed, in-focus picture, then you're really looking at, at the content of it and whether or not it's effective in communicating something. And, it's, and I really want to stress the consistency of the artist to be able to produce work. Yeah, yeah, I think you. That's the one thing I want. I want to branch off on that piece too. And Shiv, I want to have you you chime in on this because lately, like you said at the top, you've been diving into these emerging and cutting edge technologies with regard to image making, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it, what kind of piggybacking on what Barry next said with regard to things being, you know, easy is mm -hmm. is that the line? I mean, is is the line separating artists and just technicians? Uh, the fact that it's easy, you know, so the, the fact that you can put it on P and get an image or to become an artist or be to actually wear that artist badge, do you have to understand what's happening behind the P? So understand when I put my camera on P, it's doing this. And if I want to alter that, I can, I can do that. What do, what do you think? Right. So, I mean, let, let's just go back a little bit into history. As you said before, I mean, cave paintings and whatever. Mm -hmm. Artists basically are artists. And a painter, um, there's basically two kinds. There's the painter who is the modernistic graphics representation of a vision, uh, and they represent Picasso is a good example of that. You look at some of the other masters, whether they be the Dutch painters or the Renaissance painters, a lot of them, if they were doing portraits, they had a model um, and the model posed for them and they sat and they represented that model in a graphic form using paintbrushes, oil paints, etc. You had the landscape painter who looked at a landscape and then did some pre-visualization and said, you know, what would it be like if I came back in the afternoon for the sun? when it's in this position, or should I come back in the morning? Uh, it's, it's a lot of pre-visualization that goes into it before you create the image. Mm -hmm. A good photographer who wants to create art basically goes through exactly the same process. He's spending a lot of time in studio setting up lights, getting the light absolutely perfect, or if it be a product, and even some product photography can be viewed as art, it's not a matter of just going there and taking a snapshot. There's a lot of preparation that goes on. There's a lot of pre-planning that goes into landscape photography. When should I go there? How should I do this? 
And maybe it's repeated over and over again before you get that one final aha moment and that aha shot. Mm -hmm. I think the problem that comes up is that photographs become repeatable. They can be reproduced. But then by the same token, a lot of art was reproduced, lithographs. They were representations of the art because more people wanted it. So duplicates were made in lithography or any other form of, let's call it, reprints of the original image. But that one image, if photographs could be taken and, let's say, one print made the negative destroyed, never to be had again, uh, would that become a singular form of art and go behind that glass wall, bulletproof, whatever it be? Probably yes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, art does take its own form as it is evolved. And it's not necessarily technology. Technology has just made it easier for us to do and set our vision into a form that can be conveying a message that we want to convey to the rest of the world. Yeah. So I, I do believe that if you separate the snapshots from the art shots, let's not call them photographs, let's call them art shots, then you can differentiate and you can say that that photography is in fact art. Yeah. Yeah, I, right. totally, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, there's, there's the top 10% in anything, uh, in any art field, quote unquote, right? Um, and that's, that's where the biggest differentiation for me comes from, is that there, there really are photographers out there who are you know, the epitome of artists. Um, but I think there's like a certain amount of, of uh, suffering that comes to being those artists, you know, that they've, they've gone out there and the landscape photographer has sat out there in the snow for 10 hours waiting for that perfect little bit of light. And then, uh, you know, it goes and it, and, it, and it becomes something more, right? There's like a science and a study and a dedication that comes to that. Whereas somebody who is just picking up a camera and suddenly deciding, okay, I've taken good photos, you know, that now I'm an artist, I think I would disagree. I mean, the average person, and this is, this is true, the average person, meaning our clients, have very little taste because they don't know what really, really great art is. And mm -hmm. opening that up to the average person has, has cheapened the value of the art, I think. So I want to have all you guys chime in on this. So the, the idea that, and I wrote some notes here. So what I'm hearing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to be a professional slash artist, you have to intrinsically understand your tools and be able to create a repeatable result, right? So that's, that's the artisan that understands his tools and can execute his vision because they understand what the tool can do and the tool becomes an extension of them. And then on the other side, the non-pro, I'm not even gonna say amateur, because a lot of amateurs are better than pros. So <laughs> the non-pro, the non-pro is the, the person that creates a happy accident and then calls it art, but they couldn't go back and do that again. Is that, is that fair? What do, you, what do you guys think? Uh, Frederick, real quick, um, there's an indicator that the meeting's gonna end in nine minutes or something. Yeah, I'm, 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 fixing, that. I'm fixing that right now. Uh, Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think that that repeatability, I think, is really the, the, the great issue. But one other, I want to get back to a point that she made about the fact that, um, that the fact that so many people are able to make what photographs that they like or that other people like cheapens it. I think that... Uh, I, I think that that's not necessarily the, the case in terms of, well, it's not the case for me. Let me just say that, you know, just the fact that so many people out there are able to make decent pictures, whether they're using Photoshop or some filters on their iPhone, uh, doesn't negate the fact that there is great work out there. I think that it gives people an opportunity to appreciate the challenges of what makes a good photograph. But just because someone can make an, a, a photograph that they're very happy with, um, using whatever tools are available to them doesn't necessarily diminish the impact or the power of the work that it's being that's really good that's made by so many photographers. I mean, you take someone who's really happy with the images that they've been making on their phone, and you show them a, a book like Mary Ellen from Mary Ellen Mary Ellen Mark, and they can appreciate the value of the artistry that went into making those that body of work. And I think that as an artist, 
it's it's the body of work that I think that really determines whether or not you're an artist as opposed to someone who periodically makes a, a great image. I mean, if you really want to define who, who's an artist and who's not, you just look at the body of work. And I think that, that, that tells you more than, more than anything uh, a single image can. It's like, show me, show me the money, right? Yeah. I can totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think you said it, uh, you know, it's again goes back to knowing, understanding your tools, how to use them. And to a great extent, that becomes the repeatability. Uh, you, you're able to see and you're able to visualize and then you're able to capture that vision, how you want it to portray it. And once you do that, uh, the body of work then evolves and very soon you have something that you can call you know, a body of work. And then do you become an artist? I think you were an artist before that. Now you have a body of work to prove your capabilities. All right. Here's here's a, a slight twist on all this, though. You know, we the 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 advances in imaging and cameras and mirrorless and 4K and all this other crazy stuff and services where we can share our work online and social media. This stuff is coming at us daily now. You know, as image makers, it's very easy to get distracted. Whereas if you rewind back a couple of decades, you know the we kept our cameras for a long time, right? So, and we got to know them. They, you know, we slept with them on our pillows and we woke up and was like, <laughs> I, I know you and I know that if I do this, it's going to do that. You know, you get really intimate with your gear. These days, people, you know, a year or so goes by and there's a new body that you're lusting after, you know, and maybe, and maybe purchasing. So you, you never have the opportunity to become intimate with your gear. Therefore, how can you ever get to the point where you're, it becomes an extension of yourself, you know, the art that you're creating. Shiv, you, you're at the cutting edge yeah. of this stuff. What, you know, why don't you take that? I, I think, you know, you make a point. I mean, we all lust after new technology, but I think all new technology is doing is making it easier. The fundamentals don't change. Yeah. Uh, you know, the fundamentals of photography are basically nothing more than vision and exposing. If you have those two, you can now what tools you use and, and what buttons are available, uh, the ability to capture in, you know, a, a smaller form factor or a larger form factor that doesn't really make art. I mean, art is made by what's in your head mm -hmm. and, and then the tools you use with it. But, uh, you know, newer technology, absolutely. It's fascinating what's going on. And, and if you really think about it, a lot of the new technology is taking us back to, as we call retro cameras, the ability to have more control with dials rather than with screens, you know, buttons rather than with, you know, touch screens and stuff like that. So it's, it's really going back to the roots of photography and allowing us to do that. But principles don't change. Principles remain the same. Yeah. I think, I think in a lot of ways though, like to become an excellent painter, right? The, it's it's so much i think it's so much harder i mean there's i mean there's a reason why there's a running joke that all photographers are failed failed artists <laughs> because photography is it is easier um to like i i can sketch and i'm okay at it but i can't i can't paint what i create right i can't paint what i create with a camera there's no way um but really 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 great photographers that i've met some of the best photographers i've ever met in the world can paint photorealism so they have such a clear vision in their head that they can translate that from their head to their fingers so well, right? Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, in my case, from personal experience, right, I can't do that. And so therefore, as I think, um, as a little bit of an artist, I think it's just, it's, it's just the, the, the Band-Aid fix, right? It's um, especially, I mean, I'm, I am always uh, a little bit against um, action photography, like, you know, just hitting an action with a make it awesome button. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's great for, it's for a certain standpoint, for a certain point as an artist, but in a lot of ways for me, if I was to use actions, it feels like it's a paint by numbers in a coloring book because you have the lines that you're given. And so if you're, if you're like, oh, if you do this, you'll get this result, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and like there's, there's still ways to screw that up and to make it better because you, you still, eventually your taste is going to grow and eventually your taste is going to evolve. And it is just a learning step. Uh, in, the, in the process of hopefully becoming a great artist, because that's what I hope for anybody who picks up a camera is to be a great artist. But it's just, I, I think it's, it's just, it's a lot, it's just, it's too easy. It's, yeah. it's too easy to get an average shot that is, that is, um, 
you know, visually and aesthetically pleasing. If you understand basic composition and basic lighting, you can get an aesthetically pleasing shot, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that image is art. But what, if, what, if, you, what if, you, if you look at it from the standpoint of that person, say the person, let's paint this fictitious person, you know, fictitious person that is like, you know what, I have this burning image in my head that I have to get out. And I, though I'm not technically competent on, you know, cameras or paintbrushes or, you know, hammer and chisel or whatever, I know this image that I have to get in my head out. It, I, I know what it is that I want to get out. So then they go and they purchase, you know, a camera and it makes it easy for them to make that particular image. So That's now they something. have that image out of their head. Is that art or is it not art? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's creative. But I wouldn't necessarily call it call it art. I would call that a learning process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's that's like the process you take to grow. Because I think people who, um, you know, people who really are masters of their craft, people who are very very good at what they do, um, the more I talk to them, the more I realize that very very few of them are using any kind of of a easy button, you know, an action to make things easier. They they really understand how to get what they want and to get what they need. There is no there is no like make it awesome button for them. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's just like a growth process in, in what, um, you know, a content creator and a visual artist is doing, which is, you know, a photographer, but, um, you know, yes, it's creative, but I wouldn't necessarily call it art. And so, so Renee, just before we, before we leave this topic, I want to, I want to ask this of all of you guys, but Renee, since we're, we're chatting, what, you know, I'm, I've said publicly, I'm one of your fans and I love, I love your art. You know, in fact, I'm going to order some of it, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's going on the, one of these frames behind me. Um, but the, can you tell us about your process, you know, and how, not so much the process of creating one piece, but the process of how you went from, you know, I can't show anybody any of this stuff to I'm now training. So what was, how did you sort of get to the point where you were hammered into being an artist? Um, well, I mean, I spent my entire life being creative. I mean, I, I started off as a sketch artist, mm -hmm. right? And then, and, and in the modeling world. So um, I've always been, everything, every single thing that I've done in my life has taken me to the point where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. And that's, that could, the same can be said for anybody. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but to the point where I was not willing to share my work, I've always been willing to share my work, no matter how awful it is. In fact, I leave it up on all my Facebook pages because it's a reminder that it took me all of those horrible photos <laughs> and all the bad ones to get me to where I'm at now. And hopefully in five or 10 years, I can look back at the art that I'm making now and go, Oh my God, I used to think that was all right. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that's my plan and my goal is that one day, I mean, <laughs> not even one day, usually the day after I publish an image, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'm that's interesting, like, that, you, it's interesting that you, you show your, your failures as well as your successes. A lot of totally. artists, a lot of artists, you know, myself included, if I could put myself in that category, there's, I'm like an iceberg. You only see the very tip above the waterline above. It's almost an iceberg or a landfill. I think a landfill is better. <laughs> it's a better well, analogy. Because I look at it as like when I was first starting out in the industry, like as, as a photographer, um, you know, I would look around and all I would see were the, like the, the perfect images that everyone was making. And it was disheartening, you know, yeah. to see that there's, there's these people posting this incredible fucking work, pardon the language, and I, there was no way that I could get to that. And it took, it took me talking to artists that I really, really admired to, for them to sit down and be like, look, I had to do a lot of really shitty art, mm -hmm. really, really bad photos to get this one, right? And so I, I didn't want to do that to, to the industry and to people who are starting out. I think that I wanted to be able to share the fact that I literally fail my way to success on every single image. The difference is that you don't give up, right? You just keep trying and evolving and trying to grow. But it's, I, I just, you know, going onto the internet and putting your artwork, especially as a new artist in the world of social media and trolls and, and you know, anonymity, it's, it's, it's scary to post your artwork for the entire world to post their opinion of whether you suck or not. Yeah. Right? And all right, all right. You, know, you just, you want to be able to share that and inspire people that, you know, it's okay that sometimes stuff doesn't work out. Yep. I hear you. All right. Before I'm going to get, I'm going to get to Shiv and Barry next. I'm going to ask you both the same question about process. Before we do that, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo. And that's our friends over at FreshBooks.com. So FreshBooks is, it's interesting with this episode because 
this week is historic. This marks the first week that we've allowed sponsors on the This Week in Photo Network on a show other than This Week in Photo. So FreshBooks has come on uh, and to say that they believe in what we're doing with TWIP. They're sponsoring Street Focus as well as This Week in Photo now and hopefully other shows in the network as we grow. And it's interesting with FreshBooks because the, you know, this is an interesting ad read because I use FreshBooks almost on a daily basis, even when I'm traveling. I was in Nashville at Imaging USA and I was actually uh, using, you know, and I hate this, I was using Southwest's Wi-Fi <laughs> that I paid, you know, under gunpoint $10 for to invoice a client. But I was able to do it from my phone sitting in my seat invoicing a client. So and before then, I never would have done anything like that. Before then, my whole office was in disarray, receipts everywhere, probably left, you know, who knows how much money on the table from just jobs that I did and didn't get paid for. But once I got everything into FreshBooks, it kind of took, took care of everything. And it bills everybody for, them, for me. The cool thing about the billing in FreshBooks is it will, the system will bill a client for you. And based on your terms for that client, will remind them that, hey, you know, your bill's coming due in five days, you should pay this or you're going to incur Frederick's 75%, you know, late fee. <laughs> and then after they, you know, it passes, it will bill them again with the 75% late fee added. And then they can go ahead and pay that through PayPal or through their credit card directly. And I just see the money show, showing up. I just get an alert that says, hey, client A paid you and it's all good. So, I manage all of my clients through there. I, I can honestly say that, you know, I probably could have used other systems, but FreshBooks sort of worked with the way my brain works. And I was able to build this week in photo and my, my other businesses to where they are easily and with less stress using them. And that's, you know, that no joke at all. So I use them daily for everything and coming up on tax time. It would be easy for me to do, you know, for my accountant to plug in and pull out what she needs to get stuff done. And it's all good. So once again, I want to thank FreshBooks for sponsoring This Week in Photo and Street Focus and just believing in us over the years because they've, uh, you know, they help a small business like TWIP do what it needs to do. And, you know, yeah, both on the side of paying for advertising so that we can reach other photographers and on the side of powering the businesses that we run. So FreshBooks is awesome. You can try them for free. You can sign up at freshbooks.com slash twip that's freshbooks.com slash twip all right guys i want to continue with this uh barry next i want to jump over to you so process wise we renee was telling us about her process with regard to you know how she got to be where she is mm -hmm. as an artisan how did you get to where you where where you are right now what was your sort of path of ascension to becoming an artist uh, like her, it was making a lot of bad photographs. Yeah. Um, a lot my, of hard drive, <laughs> my hard drives are filled with failures, with bad photographs, leading yeah. up to the point where I was able to make a good photograph. And I think that's part of the process. This is the regular practice of it. But then it's also uh, getting to the point where you're able to um, identify what really makes a good photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, I think becoming your own best editor is is a really big part of the the challenge yeah. uh, i make you know thousands and thousands of photographs and it's often the very smallest thing that makes a photograph successful for me i just did a a video on youtube about um some street photographs that i made uh in downtown los angeles a couple of weeks ago and i showed people how i kind of came on on a scene where i noticed the light in the shadow and that provided me the setting and i was uh, allowing people to sort of come and walk into my frame to sort of complete the shot. Mm -hmm. And I talk about one of the shots in there that I thought was close, but for whatever reason it was, it didn't make it for me. Mm -hmm. And it's a shot that I think, uh, you know, some years ago I would have said, Oh, this is a good shot. But, but because of how I've sort of trained my eye to see and what I'm trying to aspire to in terms of the photographs, mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was a shot that I made later in that same general location that I thought was more successful and I tried to be able to explain why it is. And I think that, that being able to identify why an image works is one of the things that elevates your, your craftsmanship. It's not just about saying, oh, this is a well-exposed, in-focus photograph. 
that I, you know, applied all these levels and curves to and sharpening and got all this. If you make a really good photograph, you should be able to look at it and be able to identify what makes it a good, good photograph. It's the fact that the light's coming from here, creating this wonderful contrast, that these leading lines are sort of leading you to my subject here. That, you know, that sort of description. And I think as a photographer, you have to become adept at that kind of language to not only allow you to be able to discern which of your photographs really work, but also to be able to appreciate the works of others and to use that information to help your development as a photographer. So, so, I so think that for me, you, was my go, journey. Go ahead, go ahead, Marinette. Go ahead. No, that, and that pretty much was my journey because I just, I just look at photographs all the time. And then when I see the photographs that I aspire to, I just start picking them apart. And I go, why does this image work? And why am I not able to make this kind of image? Why am I repeating the same images over and over and over again? Yeah. And I think getting to a point that Shiv made real quick was the fact that I think in some ways all this technology makes it more difficult to become a photographer because we come not only fixated with the gear, but we spend so much time trying to learn the new gear that we're not spending that time just developing a visual sensibility. Right. I mean, if, if you were shooting 25, 30 years ago, uh, technological, te technologically, cameras weren't advancing that much. So at some point, you know, you had your F4S or whatever you had with a 35 or 50 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. you know, the next camera really wasn't going to be a revolutionary new, new upgrade. I mean, there were going to be some features there, but you were forced to go, okay, here's my camera. Here's my lens. I'm really going to have to learn how to see, how to compose, how to be sensitive to light in order to improve my photography. But now because of all this technology, I think we become not just <clears throat> obsessed about technology, but we actually spend hours and hours and hours of time trying to learn the technology. And as a result, we just become stagnant as far as our development as a photographer. Totally. Totally. I, I, I uh, you know, on, on Twitter before I told folks about when I was in the military going through the training to be a photographer, one of the exercise they gave us exercises they gave us was to, they gave us a, we, I think at the time I was shooting with a Nikon F3. So I had a Nikon F3 and they gave us 50 millimeter lens and this was in Denver, Colorado. So Nikon F3, 50 mil lens, they dropped us downtown, you know, a group of us and told us that we, with one roll of film, remember this is film, right? So one roll of film, 36 exposures, and we had to come back with at least, I think, I think the number was like 10 great head and shoulder portraits with a 50 mil lens on a regular frame, which meant we had to get in the face of our, you know, our subjects and establish a rapport and get the shot. Hardest exercise ever. Cause I'm, you know, you may not know it, but I'm a shy guy. So I was shy and I would go down there and like, how the heck am I going to do this? But after one or two, it was easy. You know, you get it. But the point to, to piggyback on what you're saying, Barry Next is, you know, that the, the restriction of gear, I feel like made me a much better photographer that ex in that particular exercise, because we're, when they were explaining the exercise to us back on the base, they were like, okay, you see that gear cabinet? And you can imagine the Air Force had every lens available to man in there, you know? And they're like, you know, you see all that? You're not taking any of that. You're taking this, <laughs> you know, and go down there and come back and process your film and show me what you got, you know? So that was a good exercise. So Shiv, I want, I want to take it to you. So when you look at this, you know, first of all, the process side of it. So tell us what your process was to get from where you were just starting as a photographer up to where you are now. How did you become an artist? So it's, it's kind of a funny story. You, you probably heard that I started photographing when I was 13. Mm -hmm. But I was formally training to be a painter. And I spent my, you know, childhood years, teenage years becoming a oil and watercolor artist. Mm -hmm. And eventually switched to the most difficult medium, which is India ink. Uh, one of those things where you can't make a mistake, you can't paint over it. It's so, permanent. Yeah. It's permanent. So 1983 was the last time I did an India ink uh, piece of work, which still hangs on the wall. But... What it did for me was forced me into looking at artists, going to the museums and going to art galleries and studying what the artists did. How did they create these images? And, and what's the play of light that they used? Why did they do what they do? And, and to pretty much a point where you become obsessive about it and that becomes what I consider my pre-visualization. 
So I started pre-visualizing what I wanted to create. And actually my head swims with images that I want to create. Yeah. And what it does is when you go out, you start looking for recognition. So the recognition is I pre-visualized and now I see something that represents one of those pre-visualized images. How do you then create it? And yes, hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of thousands of failure after failure after failure. But you eventually get to that point where you say, the two have now come together, the vision and what you're seeing in front of you, and you capture it. So those images, if they don't have an emotional connection for other people, it doesn't really matter to me. It has an emotional connection to me because what I pre-visualized is now what I've been able to capture or at least create in some form. And once you do that, if the message is true, other people will get it. And if other people get the message, I think that starts leaning towards what you might want to call art. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it. it's, 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 <laughs> I, you know, this, it's, like a, it's like a slippery pig, this topic, right? <laughs> oh, yes, it is. It is. It is. Well, I mean, it's, it's something that, that nobody's ever going to agree on, ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, admittedly, uh, every single time this topic comes up, I kind of want to puke because nobody's <laughs> ever going to agree. You know, yeah. it's, it's just that's how it's going to be. And I think in some ways that's kind of what makes it fun is that there's controversy. And a lot of people would argue because there's controversy, there's art. So... All right, so I'm going to leave this up. Keep making happy pictures. If you love what you're doing, who gives a Do shit it. about what anybody else thinks? Be yeah, happy. Don't, don't listen to any of this. So, I'm going to leave this topic with one question for each one of you guys. Barry next, I'm going to start with you. So back, we started with the discussion on the Peter Lick photo a little bit, or I alluded to it. The Peter Lick photo that sold for six point something million dollars, was it worth it, and is it art? If I was Peter Lick, it was definitely worth it. <laughs> Okay. You know, yeah. I mean, for me, it's not, when you, when you think about the whole gallery system and, and stuff like that, it, the photograph, I think for a large part for those people is a commodity. Yeah. Uh, they may have an appreciation of art, but I think a lot of the people who are spending that kind of money are looking at it as an investment. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, it may or may not have been an investment. Was it worth uh, the money as a piece of art? You know, that's completely subjective. I know that, as far as I'm concerned, if someone's willing to pay me six million dollars or six thousand dollars or six hundred dollars, uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with them whether it's out or not. I'm right. just gonna hope the check clears. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Perfect. Well said, R Renee. What about you? It, art, not art. What was it? Um, I think it's irrelevant. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's it's this whole like this argument over whether whether you know his image is art or not is is totally crazy and i think there's a lot better things <laughs> that people could be doing with their time other than thinking whether somebody's photos were six million or not i mean the whole the whole process of why paintings go for the the multi-millions that it do is bizarre to me uh but at the same time if somebody's willing to pay for it that's awesome i think it's great i think it's freaking awesome that somebody is finally willing to pay six million dollars for a photograph bring it spend money photographers need money let's spend it let's yeah. find people more people who want to spend six million dollars on some photographs that you know maybe come from a different artist mm -hmm. you know i mean i think that should be seen as inspiring to us and to photographers then like oh my god i can't believe somebody paid for that when it's a crappy photo you know who cares if it's a crappy photo and let's get more people spending money on on artists on, on photographers like let's Let's do this shit. <laughs> I love it, Renee. I think you should. I think you should price all of your work at five million, and then and then discount it down to one million. Have a fire sale. One million dollars right. each. You know, you're good yeah. to go. I'd be all right with that. Anybody wants to drop a million bucks on me, I'll take it. Let's go. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here. It's a bargain. Shiv, what about you? The Peter Lake photo. Thoughts? Um, yeah, thoughts. So, uh, as I say, it's the guy who bought it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, is it an investment for him? Did he consider it art and is he willing to pay for it? And I think he was. I go back to a few years ago when Station, you know, when, when his image sold for, what was it, $1 million or, or a little over a million dollars and everybody went, wow, photographs can sell for that much. Uh, it, it's okay. I mean, you know, Renee, you should. Five million bucks, discount it, get whatever you can. Twenty five percent off. Let's go. Yeah. So, there you go. Limited yeah. time only. I mean, I think Peter that day made ten million dollars because he sold two other pieces to the same guy. 
And, uh, you know, if that's an investment, hopefully it materializes into a little bit more money tomorrow. I mean, who knows? But, uh, yeah, it, I don't say it's art as art. It's art as an investment. So I love it. I love it. Well, hopefully that person can... Uh, you know, turn around in 10 years or so and sell that piece of art for $10 million and keep it, you know, keep the value going there. Well, there you, guys. Or you might have to do, do Renee's discount, right? There you go. There you go. Yeah. Hey, that was my discount. I'm consulting her. <laughs> By the way, I get 2%. Special price just for you. 2%. 2% just for you. $2. $2. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So I'm, uh, you know, we've got two other topics to hit on in here, but we're coming up to the hour already. We spent, we spent all our gas on that first topic. The other two topics are, is the career of photojournalism dead? And then how do you make money as a photographer? I'm thinking what we'll do is we're going to skip those for now. And I'm going to invite you guys back to do a second part, a part two of this particular episode and then we'll uh we'll hit those topics so we don't have to rush through them and not do them justice you guys good with that yeah sure okay awesome all right well with that let's dive into the listener q a this is where we take a, a question or two in this case one from uh one of our listeners and this one comes from quote a lawyer a loyal soldier in the twip army awesome welcome soldier uh, this soldier says, I've, I've attended three trade shows last year, and each time on the flight home, I found myself thinking, what a waste of time and money that was. Do you guys think trade shows are still worth attending? And if so, what's the best way to get the most value from attending one? Shivana, you, you go first. What do you think? Um, you know, a lot of trade shows are a waste of time. Mm -hmm. But I think if trade shows were to concentrate on specifics, then they would be more worth it. Uh, CES to me is a total waste of time because I'm not interested in dishwashers and washing machines and things like that. No. Uh, if I'm a photographer, I want to go to a photography trade show. Uh, by the same token, something like Photo Plus Expo, which is exclusively for photography, it makes sense to go and attend it. Uh, but if Photo Plus Expo becomes you know, another CES, then I'll probably never go there again. Yeah. So he's right. It, it is a waste of time because I think uh, manufacturers are trying to push too much of what they do into one forum rather than segregate it to more specifics. And uh, that's, that's where I stand. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, from my standpoint, you have to, much like many things in life, you have to go there with a goal in mind or an end result in mind. So don't just show up there thinking that the clouds are going to part and, you know, you're going to walk away and energized and yeah. enthusiastic about photography. So, but if you go there and you're like, okay, my goal here is to connect with five influencers to help me build my business. Or my goal here is to figure out what the next camera I should buy is. Or my goal here is to A, B, and C. You're, say you're running a retail business is to find suppliers for albums or whatever. If you have a list of specific goals and you, and you, you hit those when you're there, then you win. If you just throw yourself into the fray, you're going to quickly get frustrated because at these trade shows like Photo Plus, like Shiv mentioned, gigantic oceans of people are there. You know, it's just it's a never ending ocean of, of people that yes. uh, and booths and, and sessions and all this stuff that you'll get frustrated really, really quickly. Renee, what do you think? Trade shows worth it? Not worth it? I'm the black sheep this episode. I think trade shows are freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're usually there presenting, <laughs> surrounded by fans no, that are no, like, no, 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 I have no. an autograph. <laughs> oh, bugger off. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, no, no. I think trade shows are great because like how, like I started out when I went to my first trade show as WPPI. I didn't know anybody. Nobody knew who I was. I was a non-existent, you know, blip on nobody's radar. And going to trade shows, like for me, I think they're great because it's the biggest collection of people I give a shit about in one place, right? Because otherwise all my friends live all over the world, right? I don't ever, I get to see them on like one-on-one -on -one basis. But yet when you go to these, when you go to these conventions and these trade shows, there's you know, like the, the grand ocean of people, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many people there and there's so many amazing artists and there's so many inspiring people, right? You can wind up meeting somebody who's like, oh my God, you're from the same town I'm from mm -hmm. and you're awesome. Right? This isn't the internet anymore. Like, they, you know, meeting people on the internet doesn't mean anything like it used to. Meeting people face to face is where you're going to make great business connections, great friends, great mentors, maybe people that you can mentor, right? Business connections, sponsors. I mean, like that, like what, trade shows 
are what you make it. And if you show up there with a shitty attitude, like expecting that this trade show has to deliver you, you know, like the hand of God of your next inspiration, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right. But if you go in there with an open mind and you want to talk to people and you want to learn and you want to grow and you want to meet new people and hang out with friends and hit like the after parties and get stupid, you know, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> right. And you can do that around all these people. Yeah. And like, I think, I think people just like completely underrate, you know, like, you know, I demand this, this trade show to deliver me my next, you know, leap in business. You're just like, get over yourself. You know, you get out of them what you get, what you put in. And if you go in there with an open mind and you just talk to people and you talk to reps and you talk to, you know, people that you recognize, maybe artists that you, you follow online and you go, you walk up to them and say, Hey, you know what? I really love your work. I love, you know, seeing what you're doing and, um, you know, thanks for putting your stuff out there. Things like that, like that's soul food, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, like, so, you're, like, so you're you're hitting it more from the standpoint really awesome. of of networking and and that side of it. And I agree with you. Well, yeah, and, and that's you totally part of get, that's business. part of going in there with a goal, right? So I'm going to go in there exactly. and I'm going to be open. I'm going to meet people. I'm, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of speakers that I was speaking to at um, at Imaging USA in Nashville just just a couple of days ago were like, yeah, the the best part of trade shows are what happens outside of the sessions and the show floor. It's exactly. The, the trade shows just bring meeting. everyone together. Mm -hmm. The trade shows are the glue that pulls everyone together, right? So you can get there and you can get all grabby hounds on the new gear and like, you know, salivate over the Hasselblad and, you know, like high five Peter Hurley, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do all that and it's awesome. But like the, the best part of the trade shows is what happens after, you know, and, and we have the trade shows to thank for that. You know, like there's a lot of people who put in, you know, hours and hours and months of work to make these things happen. And I wouldn't have the career that I have today if it wasn't for going to that WPPI a couple of years ago. You know, I have a lot to thank for those trade shows and I still do. And, um, you know, that's, I don't know, that's my opinion. I have flip desk. I like it. I like it. So, a very next, what about you? What do you think? I mean, is it, uh, you know, piggyback on what, what Renee just said. Is it, is, you know, the, the social aspect of trade shows, it maybe, is it time for trade shows to morph into like leaning into that? Or should they stay as they are? And what do you think? Are trade shows worth it, period? I, I think they already are there. I think Renee's right on point. I think that's one of the people, one of the reasons people go back over and over and over again. You know, whether it's WPPI or Photo Plus or, uh, you know, Photoshop World. I think the, the big attraction to that, uh, besides, you know, having access to, to some of the new uh, equipment or some of the presentations by some of these, you know, celebrity photographers, uh, is the, is that the, the, the opportunity it provides you to be with like like people because mm -hmm. I think most photographers work in isolation, um, and it's amazing to be surrounded with by people who are as passionate about photography as you are. So I think that you know I think every photographer should at least have an opportunity to go once to one of these trade shows. Uh, but at some point, I think that if you're making it a sort of a, a regular a, a regular uh, trip. Uh, you might one year want to consider spending all the money that you would spend going to New York to photo plus and spend it on really going to somewhere in the world where you could practice photographs, practice photography for a week, mm -hmm. you know, maybe with or with other people. But I think uh, going back to that whole argument about technology being the focus of our, of our work, sometimes we, we as photographers, uh, you know, don't take the time that we have, and the money that we have to really create opportunities for ourselves to become better photographers. Yeah. And while uh, trade shows definitely have a place, uh, I think people should also look at other alternatives to, to sort of further their passion for photography. Now, Shiva, I know you were thinking when he was talking, you're thinking, you know what, they should take some of that trade show money and put it towards coming to Iceland with this week in photo, right? You bet. You bet. <laughs> I love it. Cool. We can have we can have a big trade show after party in Iceland. Yeah, <laughs> on a glacier. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's jump into the picks of the week. Um, this is a segment where you guys can recommend something something to the TWIP army. Uh, Renee, Robin, I'm going to let you go first. What would you like to recommend to the This Week in Photo Army? Learn a friggin' Wacom tablet. <laughs> you know, I, I love the Wacom tablets. Uh, the, the Intuos 5, particularly the small, is awesome. And I live on it. And it's, it's just, you know, it's irreplaceable. There's nothing else on the planet that can replace that for me. And I think that as photographers, particularly the people who are looking to get into compositing and digital art, uh, it'll just revolutionize 
um, you know, your work if you get comfortable with it. But if you're not used to it, you got to hide your own mouse on you for about three weeks first. So you can just like force yourself to use it. But um, the Wacom Intuos 5 is is always probably my number one pick. I think it's awesome. Love it. I was going to ask you about that because uh, who was telling me, who made me buy that? Aaron Nace from Flurn.com is the one that pushed me into getting a, getting a Wacom tablet. But I tell you, I'm hitting that wall between letting go of my mouse and using the Wacom. How do you break that? You know, because it's like joined to me using the mouse. How do you break that? Throw at your mouse. <sighs> oh, <it's laughs> heresy. Heresy. It is not heresy. You just put your little mouse in a little mouse trap, and the little mouse trap goes in a box, and you lock that box. <laughs> uh, I, got cool one. I got the wireless one and everything, and it's... Uh, you know what, though? Your photo doesn't care how cool your mouse is. Your photo cares how cool your photo is. Uh, <laughs> Learn uh, <to> tell it. <laughs> all right. Maybe I'll try it for a week. I'll, hide my, I'll take the batteries out of my mouse for a week. Three weeks. Three you can weeks. use it for surfing. Use it for surfing on the internet. Use it for everything. Just get real comfortable with it. Make that little pen your best friend. And the other thing I would recommend is mapping down your tablet area. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that I found that was happening a lot, I mean, for people who follow my work, I do a lot of compositing. So, you know, anywhere from four hours to five days per photo. And what was happening is I was burning out the joint in my wrist and my elbow and my shoulder from too much of movement, big movement. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I recommend the small. Uh, what you can do is you can map down so that the amount of the tablet area that you use is quite little. So I have my tablet, the whole tablet mapped down to about two square inches. And that is like that pans two screens. And so oh. it, it takes it takes a while to get there. You have to be really comfortable with it and slowly work your way down to a smaller area, but it'll reduce the amount of injury that you're gonna get in your joints. And also it doesn't burn out your entire tablet surface, just like tiny little squares at a time, so you just move it around. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cool. All right. The Wacom tablet. I'm going to give it another shot. I think I'll take it out of the box and, and try it again. It's in the box. Your mouse should be in a box, not the tablet. Hey, don't get me started. Um, so much, so Bad much pressure. stuff to learn. So little, so little time. Yeah, but that's a, well, I don't know. You can, you can berate me later on that. <laughs> All right. Mr. Verma, Shiv Verma, what about you? What's your picture? So, uh, Renee actually, you know, says the right thing. So just listen to her, right? Yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, actually, the, 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 <laughs> the Intuos 5 is no longer the Intuos 5. They now call it the Intuos Pro. Oh, Those listeners right. wanted to go get one. It's the Intuos Pro. And oh, by the way, one thing, you know, her joints are hurting. Well, if you continue to use a mouse, you're going to get carpal tunnel. Uh, so use the pen and you won't have carpal tunnel. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah. all right. I'm okay. going to take it out of the box. Stop. So my, my pick of the week, my pick of the week, I mean, yes. technology, we talked about technology and how it evolves. And sometimes you want technology to go a little backwards. Mm -hmm. So the Panasonic Lumix LX100, which in my opinion is, uh, you know, I call it the Lusters Leica. The Lusters Leica. Yeah. And I think the LX is pretty well attuned to the term lusting. <laughs> Liking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the Lusters Leica has a feature that uh, for a portrait photographer, and particularly people who love shooting outdoors, uh, you may or may not realize that it actually has a leaf shutter. Hmm. So when a camera has a leaf shutter, you're no longer limited to <laughs> your sync speed. Yeah. So I can fire off a flash at one two thousandth of a second at full power not have to worry about high-speed sync where I'm only getting a little power out of the flash and I can shoot away outdoors, control bright sunlight, control sunsets, sunrises, etc. And it is an amazing piece of work. Now, yes, it has 4K and you can do photo extracts and you can do harvesting and all the other good stuff. But I think the, the one reason for people who are Portrait photographers that they must, must, must get a leaf shutter camera, go get the LX100. Nice. So what is that? What, how much does it cost? Oh, it's uh, about 900 bucks or less. Yeah. 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 And cool. it, it, it has an exquisite lens. Can you see it? Yep, I see it. It's, it's a Leica lens, um, f1.4, so it's nice and fast. And you want retro, it's got retro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually have one of those. That is one of my... That is. Uh, I would say right now my favorite kind of grab and go camera specifically because, cause you mentioned the retro piece of it. 
Um, on this particular camera, it's missing that PASM dial on the top. So the what what they did was instead you have a a ring for shutter speeds and then a manual aperture f-stops and then A on both controls. So if you set yep. it in A, you're in program mode. If you move your aperture ring, you're now in aperture priority. If you put it in A on the aperture ring and move the shutter ring, you're now in shutter priority. And if you move both rings, you're now in full manual. So, you know, I, I thought it was pretty brilliant the way that they tackled that right. and simplified the top of the camera by removing that. And oh, by the way, if you are in shutter priority mode and you set your shutter speed to, let's say, 4,000, mm -hmm. and now you want uh, 16,000 or faster, then, or 8,000, uh, you actually move the focus ring to get more shutter speed. Oh, I did not know that. Time for a little more playing yeah. before I start but, with whack em but, but I tell you, it, it, it is absolutely awesome. And, and you know, the, the more I sort of play with it, the more I'm, you know, falling in love with it. So Yeah, yeah. And that camera has a micro four-thirds sensor in there, too. So it's a relatively yeah. large sensor, right? I mean, I actually, on my web, on my last blog, uh, two blogs ago, I posted some images of a model shoot that I did. And I actually took just 8 megapixels of the 12 megapixels and blew it up to a 60 inch by 90 inch image. And the quality is incredible. 60 by 90 inches. Wow. Okay. Inches. Now, did, okay. Did, how did you blow it up? Did, I mean, were you using some sort of fractal interpolation yeah. software? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, used, uh, I used the On One Photo Suites uh, uh, perfect resize mm -hmm. and uh, blew it up to, you know, five feet by seven and a half feet, and it's exquisite. Okay, so so people might listening to this might say, "Hey, you know that sounds like a lot of work. Why not just get a full frame DSLR or the Sony A7 with all those pixels instead of letting the computer do the math and interpolate?" Uh, I think I'm going old. I like something <laughs> nice and light. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so thanks. So Panasonic Lumix LX100. Renee has the Wacom tablet and Tools Pro and a Barian X. What's your pick of the week? Uh, my pick of the week is a documentary film called Everybody Street. Uh, oh. It came out last year. It is a documentary about New York street photographers. Um, it's just a fantastic documentary about uh, people who've been practicing street photography who are just really amazing. Um, they interview people like Joe Meyerwitz, mm -hmm. uh, Bucky, uh, Bruce Davidson, uh, just a lot of people that some people know and some other people who people may not be as familiar with. So I think if anybody has an interest or a passion for, for street photography, that's a documentary that you, you, you have to watch. I think I've watched it three times already. I mean, I really enjoy it. It's really inspiring. Uh, really cool. It's, where, where is that? I mean, is it for purchase or is it on Netflix? Yeah, you, I think you can currently purchase it off of iTunes. Uh, you can purchase it on Amazon. And if, if you can't find it there, just go to their, their website. If you just do a Google search on everybody, <laughs> uh, you'll find it. And I actually interviewed the, the, the filmmaker uh, last year. I, I, I draw a blank on, on her name. But mm -hmm. if you just look up Everybody Street and the Candid Frame, you'll see the interview. And it's really fascinating. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. I will definitely put that on my, my Amazon. Hopefully it's on Amazon Prime Instant Video. I'll check it out there. <laughs> Excellent. All right, guys, we're wrapping up. My, my picks are, I've got two. Um, so I was able to meet the guys at Peak Design. Um, they're actually here in the Bay Area, but they were, they were in Nashville on the show floor. So Renee, again, that whole meeting people thing, right? So I met with the, one of the co-founders there. I actually interviewed him on the show floor about their stuff. And I was a customer before I met them. So I was a big fan of Peak Design. And what they do is they started out with this uh, uh, clip type thing that you basically, you can clip your camera to your, tri to your backpack mm -hmm. strap or to your belt or whatever. But then they recently released these, uh, a line of camera straps, which I'm just a huge fan of. Here's one of them. Um, you know, if you're watching the video, you can see this one. This one's called the slide. Um, they've got demonstration videos on their site, but essentially it's made out of like the seat belt material with ha which has like this quick release on it. So you can change the size and configuration on it. Um, the cool thing about 
about Peak Design and the reason I went with them for all the cameras that I have is this thing right here. And if you're listening, this is a little tiny little round uh, attachment thing that connects to your camera lugs and then that clips into their system. So like for example, here's my LX100. It's got two of those things on either side and I'm using their product called the cuff on here, which is like a wrist strap. But if I go out and I'm like, okay, today I need to use a regular camera strap, I can easily disconnect this thing by just push pulling on it and now it's off and I can put on another camera strap and go. So now I don't have multiple camera straps and I don't have to worry about taking this one off and putting that one on and that pain. I just have a couple of camera straps and a bunch of those little uh, connectors on my camera bodies and I can grab whatever the right tool is for the day and roll. So the, the cuff, that little tiny wrist strap is 20 bucks, it's like 19 and change. And the slide is 60 bucks, which is kind of pricey, I think, for a camera strap. But when I talked to them and I interviewed them and they explained how it was made and, you know, it's just a company that I kind of believe in in terms of the next generation um, type of company that's building stuff for photographers. They, they are 100% Kickstarter funded and they intend to continue being 100% crowd funded. So every... Every product they release, including the first one and these latest ones, they run Kickstarter campaigns to generate the revenue to, to create the product, and then they put them up for sale based on user input and feedback. And they have no board of directors, no nothing like that. They're just a group of people that are asking photographers what they want, and they build it, <laughs> and then they rinse and repeat. So I thought it was a, it's a cool business idea, and the products are just, you know, the quality is through the roof. So... Yeah, definitely check them out. They're at Peak Design, and we'll, we'll link to them in the show notes for this episode. So giving you one more pick of the week, Fred. Yeah, yeah, go for can it. You, can you hold up your LX where the shutter button is? Yes. And can you talk about the shutter button? I'm talking about the shutter button so that the video – is the video on me? It's not switching to me, is it? Yeah, it is on you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm talking about the shutter button. Here's the shutter button. What about it? Button, button. Yeah, why is it red? Oh, oh, why is my, <laughs> my shutter button is red because I, this again was a trade show tchotchke that I got from, I, I think it was the Garris booth. My favorite colors is, uh, you know, evidenced by TWIP and, and everything else I do are black and red. And they have these red shutter button attachments that you put on there. And I wanted to raise my shutter button up, but I also wanted it red just for, because I thought it was cool. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, the, the reason I bring it up is it, it allows you to have a much softer feel and control on your shutter button. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a great tool for most uh, digital cameras where the shutter button is not as responsive, but something like this makes it much more responsive as far as touch and feel is concerned. So, yeah. Yep, I like it. And yeah, for me, I'm much more shallow than you are, Shiv. So mine was just because it looked pretty. <laughs> Uh, don't spoil it. <laughs> hey, you know, you, you, you're much classier mm. than I am. I can't. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, we are at the end of another episode of TWIP. Thanks all you guys for jumping in at the last minute and doing the show and, and helping me, you know, sort of wring the truth out of Renee Robin and her statement <laughs> about photographers <laughs> not being artists. So again, send your hate mail to Renee Robin on Facebook. No, uh, no, 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 no. All that hate mail definitely goes to Frederick Brand Johnson at twip.com. Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. Keep but it remember, we are thoughts. talking. I am I get enough in the twip army here. Come on. You know, yeah, I get enough hate mail. I don't need more. I, I'm already a bad person. Apparently. No, you're a wonderful person. <laughs> And, uh, especially since you, you took time out of your day to come on the show. So you're exceptionally <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so, but thanks to all, all three of you at Barry and X, uh, Shiv Verma, Renee Robin for coming on and uh, helping us out with episode 398 of This Week in Photo. And uh, folks that are listening to this, you can check us out at thisweekinphoto.com. I also want to thank our sponsor for this episode, and that's our friends over at FreshBooks. Remember, head over to freshbooks.com slash twip to see how they can help you run your business like we do here at This Week in Photo. All right, Renee, uh, tell us where, what's a good URL for people to go check out some of the work you have? Uh, it depends what you want to do. If you want to be nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to, if you want to, if you want to not be 
nasty. Um, you just go to www.renerobinphotography.com. So that's R-E-N-E-E-R-O-B-Y-N photography.com. Awesome. Um, there's also Facebook and Instagram and Google Plus and the whole nine yards. So whatever your social media spiel <clears throat> you're into, there's, I probably have some amount of presence there. So Yeah, Renee, I think you're big enough now. You could just say, just Google Renee Robin and... Google Renee Robin Photography. Because if you Google Renee Robin, all the modeling crap shows up. And I don't know if anyone wants to see that. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay. There's, there's a difference. Excellent. All right, Renee Robin Photography. Marion X Perillo, where can people go to connect with you and see what you're working on? Uh, they go to the candidframe.com. So everything there regarding the show, my podcast, my blogs, books, uh, you'll find it all there. Excellent. Cool. All right. And Mr. Shiv Verma, what about you? Simple shivverma.com. That's easy. And that's yeah. S-H-I-V-V-E-R-M-A. Got it. Excellent. All right, guys. And once again, be sure to visit our website at thisweekinphoto.com. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>